pray for God's people at three levels. Pray for God's people at three levels. There are pivotal moments in the history of a country, um, and in churches as well, when things can go good or bad. People can follow bad leaders, bad influences, or better leaders and better influences. I'm still a little miffed on how to start this message. I mean, I had a start, but basically what we heard today that the Fox News has, has caved um, and we can't trust them anymore is it's kind of discouraging. One thing to remember, I know we all know this, but one thing to remember, um, God is in control. He allows Satan to do so much, but he can reel it in. God is in control. And sometimes, out of something bad, something good happens. I'm just mentioning, it's not that these are parallels, but the more Paul the Apostle was politically uh, hassled, the greater the gospel spread. It's kind of weird. It's like uh, the more they persecuted him, the greater the message became. Anyway, I'm, I guess what I'm saying is God has a way of sometimes bringing victory out of what looks like apparent defeat. I'm not, now I'm not sure, like I told our local church, pray that God doesn't give America the government we deserve. That's not what you want. You want you you want a blessing, not the government we deserve. Um, and pray for good influences. I live in Cape Girardeau, which is Rush Limbaugh's hometown, and the rumor is that Rush Limbaugh's cancer treatment's not going well. I'm not saying that's true. I'm just saying that's what I've heard. Um, we need good influences like Rush Limbaugh. He has an analysis of the far left that's clear and cutting, and you really see it. And he's been that way for 30-some years. We need to keep people like we need Rush Limbaugh, especially right now as the media goes into the dark side. And pray for better leaders. Pray for more truth, less corruption. Pray for less lies, less propaganda. Obviously, pray that election fraud fails. Because as, if people lose confidence, as Mark said, in the election, the glue that holds society together, can we ever trust another election? I mean, you, you start thinking these kind of things. Powerful forces are against good values. I'm going to read the scripture you're all familiar with, but I'm going to read Ephesians 6, 11, and 12. Ephesians 6, 11. Paul writes, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. In other words, he's very tricky, clever. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age. And this is still Satan's age, age of darkness. A spiritual host of wickedness in high places. It's spiritual warfare. You know, China is known as the land of the dragon. It's just entries that COVID started there, and maybe intentionally they released it. Anyway, maybe that's maybe debatable, but at least one thing is for sure. Once it got out, they decided, we're going to share it with the rest of the world. Why should we suffer only? And they obviously did that. And, the, and it seemed like how all these things work together, all these young people pin up, so what, when the left said, go out there and riot, they, oh, we're ready to do it, all because of COVID and the election distortion because of COVID. And it, you can almost see, you know, if, if you're in a boxing match and like you set them up with one punch and hit them with the other one, it's like Satan is doing that to the world and to America. Now, the one thing about the uh, spiritual forces to keep in mind, it's bad if you don't believe they exist. If you think all the evil is purely coincidental, that's bad. The other extreme is to put too much attention on the on spiritual forces. You know, we don't want to think about them too much, obsessed with them, because that's not good for us either. But really, I believe evil spiritual forces are 
dividing society, weakening, destroying God's people, the people of Abraham's promise. And in this order, number one, Israel or Judah, capital Jerusalem. Number two, America, capital Washington. Number three, Britain, capital London. The devil uses, you know, he's the power, the prince of the power of the air. He's using big media, big tech to sow lies and discord. Now I'm gonna go back to a time in history when Judah had failed spiritually and they were about to go into captivity and the great prophets like Isaiah and Jeremiah warned them of their bad behavior. I'm gonna to go to Isaiah 59, but you will see possible parallels to what we're heading into in the future and what we should pray against. Isaiah 59, 14. 59, 14. Justice is turned back. Righteousness stands afar off. Like it's way off there. Truth has fallen in the streets. That is so picturesque. If you watch the American media, would you agree that truth has fallen in the streets? Like, just like that. Truth has fallen in the streets. Now that was true of Judah back then. Then he goes on. This is an interesting verse. Verse 15 of Isaiah 59. He who departs from evil becomes himself a prey. You know, there was a billionaire who roughly about 20 years ago changed his lifestyle, uh, became pro-life instead of pro-abortion, uh, more of a Christian than in the past. And all of a sudden, all his Hollywood buddies and supporters start to turn on him. He used to be popular with them. Like, maybe the one that you can remember the most easiest is Sarah Palin. She was a potential threat uh, with her obvious criticism of Barack Obama, what they were planning, um, and probably has good basic Christian values, family values, et cetera. No politicians, perfect. But all of a sudden, you could almost sense it spiritually. The media descended on her like a pack of vultures, like a wolf pack, a ripper apart, I mean, reputation-wise. Um, and it was so unfair, but you could, you could tell it was a spiritual thing. It wasn't just, you know, well, we don't agree with her policies. You could tell. Um, if you depart from evil that's going on in Washington, you don't agree with it, you get on certain politicians' enemy list, certain media's enemy list. In other words, being good is not rewarded in this world. You become a prey, as Isaiah said. Um, Isaiah 59, verse 3. And now this is obviously a criticism of Judah before they went into captivity. For your hands are defiled with blood, your fingers with iniquity, your lips have spoken lies, your tongue has muttered perversity. No one calls for justice, nor does anyone plead for truth. In other words, they don't want to hear truth. That's the last thing we want. We don't want to hear truth. You want to hear it's good to do whatever we want to do. They trust in empty words and speak lies. Now I want to, if you picture this as a way of the way they're acting in a general sense. They conceive evil and bring forth iniquity. They hatch viper's eggs and weave spider's web. You know, like a spider's web has all kinds of connections. They come up with these clever conspiracy plots to destroy people's reputation. And all kinds of clever little... Um, internal workings of it. He who eats their eggs dies, and from, from which crushed a viper breaks out. Notice, it's really bad for society, but this is the kind of clever evil that's going on. Endless evil investigations, secret schemes of the deep state, and the media that goes after people that are targeted. Uh, like, the, like the young man who proved that the people in California and Planned Parenthood were selling baby parts, which apparently was against the rules for the, you know, the take tax money and they're profiting by selling baby parts. Do you know the state of California went after him and I think another lady that made some videos for him, prosecuted him? A matter of fact, I think our potential new vice president, one of the persons that prosecuted him and her uh, over that, 
they were actually doing a good thing, giving us truth. And what did they get for it? I think they finally beaten back the false charges that are okay at the moment. But they came after them and raided their house, and took their videos, and uh, you might know some of that. That's what I mean when they say, when you leave evil, you become a prey. Um, and we got to worry. Romans 10.1, and this is what Paul says, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. And he talks about he can bear witness for their zeal for God. Now, I want to just make this statement. If Paul was praying for the Jewish people, that means we should pray for the Jewish people. Does that make sense? If Paul's praying for them, we should pray for them. We should pray for Israel and Judah. And uh, Genesis 12.3, Genesis 12.3, uh, when God picked his friend Abraham and told him about the blessings he'd receive, then he also said, I will make you, Abraham, a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. You shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. I, meaning God, will bless those who bless you, Abraham and its descendants, and I will curse those who curse you. And all the, fam all the families of the earth will be blessed. You know, through Christ, eventually, the whole world will be blessed because of Abraham. That's part of the good news of the gospel. But praying for Israel, you'll be blessed. And I want to add a little bit to that. I'd also so pray for the expanded family of Abraham that has the, the blessings, which would include America and the British Commonwealth. Definitely America needs a lot of prayer right now, a lot of prayer. Um, I was reading a book of a Jewish writer, and he was just, um, let me just mention this first. It, when I was younger, when I first entered college, ROTC, I, that's how I got into it, was very popular. I think all freshmen had to be in ROTC unless you had health problems. Um, it was big, and anyway, we'll go all the details. But I saw within a decade, higher education flip from patriotic to unpatriotic. And I would tell people, you can, because I didn't support all the tactics of the Vietnam War, and they were spending too much money, and, you know, there are things about it you could say we could do a little of this, less of that. But what was bothersome is how they took the side of the enemy, the communists who did horrible things to people in Vietnam. Well, in other places, you probably know that when the West left Indochina, four and a half million people were murdered, most in Cambodia, but some in, in South Vietnam and other and Laos as well. But they started supporting the evil communist. Well, the world has gone from just not being patriotic, because there were certain people who were just unpatriotic. They've now gone to hating America. I remember last year, I think it was Antifa, but maybe that and some other groups, were marching in New York together, and this was their chant, because they were fighting over the wall then. No borders, no wall, no USA at all. No borders, no walls, no USA at all. Like, Wait a minute. They're saying destroy America? That's what they were chanting. And these were many of them young, college-educated, middle-class kids. These are not kids that, you know, that suffered all their life. They're spoiled brats. Well, many of them. Wow. You know, in other words, they not only are not patriotic, they're being taught to hate America. Well, anyway, going back to the writer who talked about people that don't bless um, Judah, he mentioned Germany. You know, Germany put the Holocaust, which uh, murdered millions of Jews in Central Europe. Well, you know what happened to Germany? Of all the nations in World War II, they had the highest per capita death rate. Every German city, because the British, <laughs> American bombers were after in the bomb in the daytime where they could hit what they considered economic and military targets, but the British were out for vengeance. Um, they did what, what they said they were going to do during the Blitz. They, actually, the British were better prepared for what they call strategic bombing. They burned every German city to rubble. I don't mean they missed a few. I mean, you probably heard about some of the more dramatic ones. 
but they burnt every German city to rubble. I mean, they had to do a lot of their manufacturing in caves, and it was uh, awful. Did you know that at the end of World War II, when the Russian army got to Germany, they raped two million German women, and at least a quarter million were killed in the rape. I mean, it was brutal. Well, you, you get some idea how Russian soldiers are, so you're probably no great surprise, but that's what happened to Germany. Um, and this writer says, because they cursed the Jewish people. He gives another example. The Spanish, um, we talked about this actually last time I was here, I mentioned how uh, Spain forced Jews to convert or kick them out of Spain. He says that after Spain did that, Spain went through a long decline because they had a great economy and society. After they kicked the Jews out, they were cursed and the Spanish Empire, well, anyway, went on a deep slide and you, know, you could argue, well, some of that was poor management, but he said God cursed Spain because of what they did to the Jewish people. And one interesting thing is true, America and Britain have been the most welcoming of the Jewish people, I'd say for at least the last two and a half centuries in America, and Britain at least financially been blessed. A lot of people don't realize that Britain led the Industrial Revolution, and well, we can talk about all that stuff later. But in other words, you're blessed if you pray for America, for the Jewish people, for Britain, and you're cursed if you do the opposite. So we should pray for this nation and Jerusalem, for peace in Jerusalem. The second level, um, by the way, and a lot of the radicals in this country really don't believe in the Constitution. They might use it when they need it, but they don't really believe in it. Uh, the second level is to pray that nominal Christianity and Judaism get stronger in their belief in the Bible and biblical values. If you look at the history of Britain and America, there are revivals in their history. Like uh, one writer said, Britain was getting, uh, there, it was a prosperous country, but there was just too many bad things going on in cities like London. And the British went through a revival where they got more biblical and better family values. And they claim America's gone through at least two. One of them in 1750, they say, actually helped prepare America for the American Revolution. The only point I'm getting at is, the better values and biblical acceptance in America, the better we'll be, even for our little church. Like, you know, we have a lot of promotions based on the Bible. Well, if greater and greater percentages of our society believe the Bible is a myth, that's going to make it harder for them to even want to look at anything we say. And obviously, family values are important. I remember BLM Originally on their website, they actually said they were against family values and fatherhood. As one black athlete said, that's the last thing our people need to be hearing. They actually said uh, single mothers raise kids better than, you know, a two-party family. I know when you, now recently they took it down because I guess it gets to be embarrassing. That is so obviously false. Like, it's like saying one parent is as good as two, or one leg is as good as two. I realize that some single mothers do a great job, and, and kids are unpredictable. A kid can come from the worst background and become a great person, because people have free moral agency. But still, there are all kind of stats that prove if you don't have a reasonable father figure, you're like 90% greater chance of being in prison. I get rattled off other negative statistics. But they said that. And there are people believing it in this country. We want a lot less of that and more people looking at family values in the Bible, if we can get it. If you were to go back 90 years in American history, most people believe the Bible was true. Now, maybe they didn't understand it to the depth that we do, but they still believed in the Bible. Most of them went to church, and you know, more or less their values were reasonable. Um, now, this is a stat. I got that from this year, they say 44% of Christians who identify as Christians say the Bible does not condemn abortion, abortion is okay. Now even some Catholics and the Pope are kind of wavering on the abortion issue. You think, what? Killing babies is okay with the Bible? 
And some other things they say is okay that would shock you. 50% of Christians do not believe that church attendance is required or necessary. And I realize you can, you can go online, and, and that's wonderful, but, you know, if you don't go to church, how are you going to fellowship and build each other up? But can you see that's what the world wants? One of the results of this COVID-19 um, scare has been that church attendance, even when they open them back up, is down. People say, well, I can watch it online. There's a big church in the town I live in. I talked to a guy who was one of the music directors, and they stream their church services. And I, I'm not criticizing that, but if a large number of people stay home in their jammies and watch it, are they going to get as much out of it? By the way, one thing has proven. Children who go to school online learn a lot less than if they're in the classroom. I mean, they can prove that. And these children are being cheated out of their education in too many places. At any rate, um, and close to half of the clerics, Christian ministers who come out of Christian seminaries, do not believe in a literal second coming of Jesus Christ. Maybe kind of some vague, you know, he's a great philosopher, but that is the whole essence of the gospel. We need those numbers to change, people to believe in the Bible better. Isaiah 5.20, Isaiah 5.20. Woe to those who call evil good, good evil, who put darkness for light, light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Does that describe what we see in the world today, right? It's like everything is upside down. The good guys are bad, and the bad guys are good. Like, whoa, what in the world is happening? And that was happening in Judah before they went into captivity. Romans 1.28. Now, Paul is writing this about the whole world. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do things which are not fitting. In other words, society is doing things that hurt society and hurts people. And you can kind of sense, you know, people think, well, the theory of evolution isn't such a bad thing. Actually, the people who came up with that, the, the same philosophical group, later came up with eugenics, by the way, which Hitler used to justify a lot of the bad things he did, like murdering handicapped kids and you know, all the bad stuff they did. But um, that is a horrible theory. And there are, I remember talking to one of my Chinese students, a smart young lady, and I said, do you believe in God? She said, well, she wasn't 100% sure there was no God, but she said, look, people in China don't believe in religion. They have the little red book of Mao that they're supposed to learn some things about. But basically, she says, only old women still believe in God in China. It's something for old, usually old women like her grandmother, she talked about her a little bit. Well, that's what they want to do in this country. And all the young and middle-aged people, we are progressive. We believe in evolution and secularism and humanism and a couple other bad isms that we could get into. Um, well, we want that trend to reverse and slow down. Pray that it does. Pray that we can have less decadence in society. I'm not saying they're all going to get converted to God's church. We know God isn't going to do that yet. But we can move that needle in the right direction. More family values, less decadence. And uh, they won't replace godly stuff with socialism and secularism. Because believe me, you study a history of communist socialist countries, Venezuela, Cuba, all of Eastern Europe, North Korea, and it is bad. It is bad. Um, now, some countries have moved away from some of the worst of it, um, but it, it doesn't work. By the way, you're going to, why doesn't socialism and communism work? Because it's in defiance of the laws of nature. People, when you give people free stuff or you tell them, Everybody gets the same salary no matter how hard you work or what you produce. You know what happens? Productivity goes down. I mean, people are, you got to motivate people, you know, with profits and, well, anyway, you all probably know that, but a lot of people don't. These kids come out of public school, they don't 
they know. I used to ask them, do you know the significance of the fall of the Berlin Wall? We'd have maybe one, I had one German student had a lot to say. He remembers about four or five when it happened, but, and one or two kids from private school, but all the public school kids, we never heard of any such thing. America's victory over communist empire, they never teach them that in school. I said, I used to kid, kids said, they only teach you crap in history nowadays. <laughs> right, the year or two before I retired, I got unpopular with certain faculty members as they started to hear my stuff. But anyway, I survived it, so I guess I, <laughs> it worked out. Um, this is a Thanksgiving prayer. Little Bobby, at four years old, was asked by his proud mother to pray over the Thanksgiving meal. And they all bowed their heads, and she was so proud of him. Little Bobby said, God, I thank you for my parents, for my siblings, for my grandparents, my uncles and aunts. I thank you for the turkey, for the dressing, for the cranberry sauce, for the pies and the cakes and the rolls. Then he had a big pause. His mother said, go on, go on, what's wrong, what's wrong? And he said, Mom, if I tell God I'm thankful for the broccoli, he'll know I'm lying. <laughs> but isn't that what the world has come to? Lying and more lying and lying about the lying? We need more morals and people afraid to lie in this country. So pray that America and Britain, I mean, Britain's worse off than we are from what, what I've seen, at least when I was in London, it was kind of a shocker. Anyway, we need to pray that basic values go up. Not everyone, of course, but at least an uptick. And it could go down really fast. And that's a very possibility. One of the things I was happy about when President Trump said he wanted to try to clean up education. And I'll bet you the devil saw that and said, that's my best ace in the hole, brainwashing these young people. Anyway, that's my opinion. Psalms 122, for thrones are set there for judgment, the thrones of the house of David. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they prosper who love you. In other words, if we pray for the peace of Jerusalem, we will prosper. And also pray for more love and harmony for Jerusalem, but also Washington, D.C., London, and New York. It's bad out there. It really is bad. Um, I've heard people say New York City may never come back to its greatness. When you see a great city like New York going down as it is, it's, pa it's painful. It really is. I could name some other cities that were great in the if we went back 20 or 30 years, but... It's painful what's happening to New York City. Maybe they can turn it back, I don't know. The third level is to pray for the churches of God. When I say this, it, it, it sounds arrogant, but we are more important than we think we are. You're gonna say, you're a tiny little group and Satan's got the whole world. What does he care about you? We preserve, and I think in a balanced, reasonable way, you know, balanced administration, not some bully kind of thing, we preserve a lot of key deep Bible truths that the world will need someday, and many of them will hear. Now, maybe not until the two witnesses get here, but however God works the details. But that truth is a precious thing, and I guarantee you the devil wants to crush it and you're thinking, but why does he care about us? We're tiny. We have the truth. That makes us more important than we think we are. Um, that deeper understanding. Hopefully, we're a mature church that sees things maturely. Um, the devil would like to stop us. He would like us to divide and fall away. And I've seen... Boy, I could tell you almost like a soap opera stories how the devil has divided people and once they get divided off, they fall away from the truth. And eh, anyway, some of you know even a lot more than I do. But you know the devil has to be behind a good deal of it. I'm not taking human nature's blame out, but he has a lot to do with it. Um, it's reported 
that 20 to 25 percent of churches, when they take off the COVID shutdown, are out of business and didn't come back. I mean, they're out of business and they're gone. It's like a small business. They didn't survive the shutdown for six, seven, eight months. You have to know the devil loves that, don't you? Churches going out of business? It's possible that some of the churches of God who cancel stuff because of COVID, some of them may fall apart and go out of business. I'm not saying that's going to happen, but it's possible, isn't it? And if it does, the Satan said, put another marker up there. That's the kind of thing he likes. Um, he wants us to divide, squabble, and fall away. Um, and we have to hang in there. And some people don't want a fellowship because, well, I can watch stuff online. You know, it's a blessing to fellowship with fellow Christians. It's a blessing we take for granted, but we really shouldn't. A lot of churches can't do as much of it. And our local church, we have wonderful fellowship. Actually, somebody, actually more than one person told me, when certain people left us who were kind of, let's see, wants to do their own thing on a power trip, our fellowship got better. <laughs> you know, you think, wait a minute. Uh, you hate to lose anybody, but our fellowship got better. We have great fellowship. Uh, we leave the Sabbath happy. and Anyway, I hope we can keep that. Galatians 5.7. Galatians 5.7. <clears throat> this is Paul writing. You ran, you ran well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion does not come from him who calls you. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. But he who troubles you should bear his judgment, whoever he is. In other words, if you find troublemakers in your church, that's the last person you should follow. Ask God for spiritual perception, good spiritual eyesight. When you see a troublemaker and he's looking for excuses, don't follow him. The last person you want to listen to. Um, and I realize some people don't get promotions and others get promoted or others get to do this and that's life. But if you felt you should have been promoted to deacon or deaconess and somebody else got it instead of you, maybe God is testing you to see how you're going to respond, right? If you respond magnanimously, well, I'm happy for him, and I'm going to continue to do my best, God will bless you. But if you take the other attitude, mm -hmm, I didn't get it, he got it all. Oh. And you want to undermine Satan has said, yeah, I love you, brother. Keep it up. Beware of troublemakers. Also, people who encourage you to stay home and not fellowship. And I'm not going to read uh, Hebrews 10, 24, and 25, but it basic Paul warns, those who neglect fellowship are making a terrible mistake. And if you read the rest of Hebrews 10, he talks about people ultimately falling away and losing their salvation. But he links it to those who neglect assembling together. In other words, see, it's one thing to hear a sermon, and that's good, of course, and, and looking at stuff online is good. But in church, we can build each other up. We're there to encourage each other, to learn about other people's problems. You can pray about it with a little more meaning. We're there to strengthen our fellow brethren like iron sharpens iron. Satan wants us to neglect that attendance. And Paul gives that dire warning. So pray for the churches of God. We are a major target of evil as small as we are. And if you can go to the Feast of Tabernacles, we can do a little extra fellowshipping. I know it depends on your health and, and finances, but if you can go, try not to find an excuse to stay home. Excuses will be easy to find. That extra fellowship, that's why God designed those three seasons for extra fellowship. Uh, and Pentecost, same thing. Remember uh, the weapons of spiritual warfare. Now, that first scripture I read about Ephesians 6, Paul goes on to say, we need weapons like faith, Bible knowledge, your only offensive weapon, hope, and the belief that salvation is ours, prayer, knowing that you're saved. Those are the weapons we need to build in our local churches. Pray for our nation. Pray for Israel. Pray for morals to get higher. Pray for more truth 
and better influences on, in the media. You know, there are certain people in the media, like Tucker, that I think is really pushing for truth. I mean, he may be wrong occasionally, but we need more good influences. There are a lot of bad ones out there, a lot of bad ones. And it's like they're being rewarded for their lies. Pray for the churches of God. Satan is going to ramp up evil and attack. But remember, God's in control. Pray about what happens in Washington. And pray that we can have calm in America, more love and more unity. Things look bleak right now. They do look bleak right now. But in the end, God wins. In the end, we win. We don't know what happens between now and the end. I'll admit that. And we don't know what trials God is putting us through. But a famous scripture, 2 Chronicles seven fourteen: If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. In other words, if America will start to move in a more pro-Bible direction, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Doesn't this land need healing? It really needs healing. I don't know what's going to happen. It's hard to be sure uh, what's going to happen. But just kind of in, to wrap things up, the three levels that we should pray for are for Israel or Judah over there in the Middle East. Pray for the nation. And also pray for America and Britain and the British Commonwealth. Number two, pray for the overall nominal believers in America. They get more morality they start believing in the Bible more and realize, wait a minute, the Bible does not support abortion. I mean, most people know this, but Christ and John the Baptist met in their mother's womb. Remember, John the Baptist jumped. Somehow he sensed the Messiah was in Mary's womb and he was in Elizabeth's womb. And both ba- Anyway, uh, but there are plenty of things in the Bible that make it clear that killing babies is... It's unbiblical, but they got almost half of America believe, who claim to be Christians believing it's okay. And I didn't make that up. I got that statistics from some Christian sources. I believe it's right. And it'll make it easier for us to convert people if they believe in the Bible. So pray for the nominal morality of the nation. Three, pray for the churches of God. Pray that we can thrive, survive. Because we're under spiritual warfare, and it's all over the world. We can't see it. I realize we can't see it. We can blame it all on human nature, which is part of the problem. But you know, don't you, can't you believe that the churches of God are our unique target of Satan? You know it's true. Ephesians 4, 1 to 3. Paul's, one of Paul's advice, some advice Paul gave to the people. Then the prisoner of the Lord beseech you to walk worthy of the calling by which you were called. Verse 2, with all humility and meekness. By the way, if you can stay humble, and I know that's a hard battle, people say, as wonderful as I am, or cute as I am, whatever you think, or as rich as I am, how can I stay humble? But stay humble. When you lose your humility, it's easier for Satan to get you. If you flee his influences, he tends to not want to waste time with you. Stay humble with all humility and meekness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, earnestly endeavoring to preserve the unity of the spirit by the bond of peace. Oh, this is interesting. I, I, I'll just mention this. My son was telling us about the novel he's writing. And I said, well, who is the hero? What does he look like? Well, this hero, of course, is a starship captain. I said, what does he look like? He said, well, he's bald-headed and he's handsome. I said, like me! <laughs> I couldn't help but joking on that. But that's what he said. He didn't say that handsome like me, but I, I added that part. But he did say he's bald-headed. I thought, wow, that, that kind of surprised me a little bit. Anyway, um, but pray more for love and unity for all the people around the world, but especially for the people of God to be blessed and for the churches of God. And don't fear the future. Remember, God is in control. Remember, God is in control.